Decades ago, when returning home from school, there were moments during the week when my father would ask my sister and I what we had learned on that specific day. I felt this was coming, so was totally ecstatic. I was waiting for his question, because on that day, a day when one of my favorite subjects was taught, and that was geography. I had learned loads. I had assimilated it all and was ready to proudly recite every single detail of my knowledge. I was excitedly telling him all about the lands of ancient Egypt, the Red Sea, the Phoenicians and the Mediterranean, Mesopotamia and the Tigris and the Euphrates, the Persian Empire and the Persian Gulf. And then he told me to stop. He then asked, What did you just say? I didn't hear you right. So I repeated my last sentence to him. The Persian Empire that was bordered to the south by the Persian Gulf. Son, he said, There is no Persian Gulf. It's called the Arabian Gulf. So just a little context here. My education was primarily within an international American schooling system. The textbooks that were conditioning my knowledge were indeed Western, with a level of bias that reflected a Western naming system and recollection of history. And for the West, this body of water I was just corrected on, a gulf founded in Asia to the east of the Arabian Peninsula, was identified as the Persian Gulf. Now, up to the 19th century within the Arab world, no one would disagree on any name, let alone a geographic name. Pride in the Arab identity was virtually non-existent. Only during the age of Al-Nahda, its age of enlightenment, and its subsequent resurgence of self-dignity, did questions start being asked of the general state of affairs for the Arabs. And by then, everything came into question, even when it came to names. And by the 20th century, when the question about the name Persian Gulf was being asked, did we start to witness the impact within Arab countries' official positions, reference books, and even school curricula. Empowered by the rise in Arab nationalism, the suppressed identity of Arabs had to break out out of its colonial chains, and the Persian Gulf became the Arabian Gulf. Well, at least in the Arabic language. And since the 1950s and 60s, this dispute has grown in scale and ferocity. It's become a power struggle for a name that prioritizes one nation's identity and history on the map, and that's Iran, over that of others, the Arabs. Politics have also entered the equation, and with the deteriorated relationships Iran has today with both the West and the Arabs, the name Arabian Gulf is being used strategically to spite and trigger the Iranians, further alienating them and complicating the dispute. And with this gulf being so critical in the modern era, where over 30% of the global oil output originates, control over the Gulf is vital, even if just symbolically. Hence, winning the naming dispute also seems to reconfirm one side's authority and dominion over these contested waters. This debate, Persian versus Arabian Gulf, if you want to look at it from a realist perspective, is actually a David and Goliath story. History and all its record books are in the Persian camp. Well, not all of history. There were many other names for this body of water. During the old Assyrian period, this gulf was known as the Lower Sea, complementing the Upper Sea, which was the Mediterranean. Later in antiquity, this gulf bore the name the Sea of the Great Sunrise. And further on, the Sea of the Land of Chaldea, till we arrived to the Achaemenid Empire, in the 6th century BCE. Many believe that Alexander the Great coined the term Persian Gulf, but this is not entirely accurate. It was the Achaemenids who first gave the name Pars Sea to this body of water, the Persian Sea. But many an ancient empires have called lands and waters names that don't exist any longer. Like for example, the Mediterranean was called the Great Sea for centuries by the Greeks and the Romans. The Persians, in fact, called it the Roman Sea, as did the Arabs. None of these names stuck. But Alexander the Great was no mere mortal. His is a history recorded and praised by all Western civilizations, and with the detailed travel accounts of Nearchus, one of Alexander's highest officers on the Indian subcontinent, 
and into the Gulf came the formalization of the name of this sea, the Persian Sea. And the rest is history. As I said, it's a David and Goliath story. The recurrence of Persian Gulf as a designation is enormous, and in my efforts to find a crack in the references dating all the way back to Alexander's time, failure followed failure. And upon the stumbling on some hope through the writings of one historian or another, seeking ancient evidence to prove the contrary that did indeed utilize the name Arabian Gulf, the only conclusion I would arrive at would be that such a historian either wasn't a professional historian or had any credibility at all. As an example of this research, I discovered Roderick Owen, a British employee of the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company, who also happened to be an MI6 operative, who wrote a book called The Golden Bubble, Arabian Gulf Documentary, and in it, he determinately terms the Gulf the Arabian Gulf, but unfortunately with no historic sources to defend his claim, merely his personal insignificant observations. Others allude to A.T. Wilson, an early 20th century British historian, who also had thoughts on the necessity to revisit the name Persian Gulf due to the presence of Arab tribes living on both the east and west coasts of the Gulf. Other academians and researchers claim that Pliny the Elder, a renowned Roman historian, stated that Charax is a city situated at the farthest extremity of the Arabian Gulf at which begins the more prominent portion of Arabia Felix. But this is not an accurate reflection of Pliny's words. In none of his encyclopedia, Naturalis Historia, does Pliny refer to the Gulf other than the Persian Gulf. Disenfranchised with the Western historiographers, I leaned on the Muslim geographers and cartographers of the Golden Age of Islam. al khawarizmi Abu Zayd al-Balkhi, al-Mas'udi, Abu Rayhan al-Biruni, and Muhammad al-Idrisi. Only with al-Khawarizmi in his book Kitab Surat al-Ard in the 9th century did he refer to the Gulf as the Sea of Basra. Otherwise, with the rest of his writings as well as that of the other notable polymaths, nothing doing. Over and over again, it was the Persian Gulf. But why the Persian Gulf? Why not another term denoting the civilizations encompassing the entire Gulf? For this, we have to go back to Alexander's time again and his officer, Nearchus. You see, Nearchus's journey was documented quite accurately over the centuries, and records such as the Indica by Arian told us of his fleet, his route, and the events during the Macedonians' travels from the Indus Valley to the Euphrates River. As a note, their maritime route followed the coastal waters on the eastern shores of the Gulf, thereby completely avoiding the Gulf's western shores. Not only was the Macedonian exposure to less than half of the Gulf's coastlines, while on their journey, the interactions between Nearchus and his crew with the East Coast local inhabitants were marginal. The journey was mostly at sea, so a very few Persians contacted, while no Arabs were ever seen. In addition, the Persians on a grand scale were very well known to the Macedonians, not so much the Arabs. Wars between the Greeks and the Persians for decades dominated Macedonian myth and lore, and as is human nature, game recognized game. And so, in concession to this very familiar global power and adversary, the Persian Gulf belonged to the Persians. Another side note and complication pertaining to the naming of Persian Gulf by the Macedonians, at the time, another body of water in the region was called Sinus Arabicus, literally, Arabian Gulf. The name Arabian Gulf was occupied. This name would eventually revert back to its current mutually agreed upon name, the Red Sea. But mistakes can be made, no? Even if they are over two and a half millennia old. Calling something a specific name out of habit is not necessarily justifiable. Alexander's legacy has seen many of the geographic names he'd given altered or totally wiped out. If we look at the process to name a geographic component in a systematic method like, say, using objective contributors like facts, figures, and statistics, maybe then the name would be more reflective of the reality on the ground. So in the case of the Gulf, neighboring nations, their coastlines, and population figures could all contribute to a different outcome. Seven Arab countries versus one non-Arab. Over 65% coastline in favor of the Arabs. 
and why no major Iranian city exists on the Gulf's coast, whereas on the western coastlines, eight Arab cities with an excess of one million citizens can be found. Many other facts can push the argument in the favor of the Arab camp. The question remains, is this a fair equation? To go through such a change after so much history has elapsed. But change is eternal, right? Iran itself went through a major name and identity change in the early 20th century with Shah Reza Khan, who wanted to distance modern Iran from what had always been known as Persia, its history and its associations, in the hope for a more prioritized Aryan connection to take place. But it didn't. Yet the name Iran remains. One could argue that Iran abandoned the name Persia. So why does it have a right? Or is it so connected to a name that doesn't apply to itself any longer, the Persian Gulf? Changes of names on maps is not an uncommon practice. Just alone in the last 30 years, many nations and cities have changed their names. Czech Republic to Czechia in 2016, Turkey to Turkia in 2022, and even Bombay, which in 1995 changed its name to Mumbai. All of these instances, though, dealt with one population taking a call on how they wanted to be identified. In the case of this gulf, there are two polar sides to the dispute. One standing firm with habit and the momentum of history on its side, while the other offering logic and a reaffirmation of their identity as a counter, to represent them after many centuries of misrepresentation. Talk about a rock and a hard place in this gulf. Is there a solution? One could offer a language-based option where for the Arabic language and its speakers, it's the Arabian Gulf. While in all other languages, it's not. It doesn't seem feasible. I really can't think of one to be honest, but to be fair, if a solution exists, then it should not alienate either side. Maybe the simple two-worded designation, the Gulf, I've used through this video can have some appeal. Not only does it avoid the selective spotlighting of one identity over another, but it's pretty cool to have such a title on the global map needing no further explanation. The Gulf. No other Gulf, or any body of water, would have that status. Ultimately, emotions will run rampant with any offering or middle ground on a name change. That is the nature of our world and time. After all, just think about it. It's only a name. But the problem with such a dilemma is who will be the one to rise above the other in agreeing that it's only a name.